Okay, welcome everyone to our last lecture on Gaussian processes. It's not the last lecture of the machine learning series, but it's the last on Gaussian processes, um, where we will talk about how to apply um, regression from Gaussian processes, how to apply to classification problems. Okay, so that will be the goal of today's lecture. There's, uh, there was a question about the code, about the notebook, that there were some bugs in there and you were right, I run it as well on my machine. And there was one cell which was around the sampling area, I think cell 42 or something, must be 42, no, it was 47. And there were, I was redefining the why the labels, basically the outputs, just for a little demo, playing around with short pieces of code. And then this was redefining the variable in such a way that then the follow on code crash because of size mismatches between, I guess, between the locations X and the Y. So I commented that one out and tried again, and now it should just run through. Um, however, next time, if you find a bug, it's always great if you tell me, but let me um, tell me also which cell crashes and maybe also tell me what you tried already. Okay. Whether you also have had a look at it and I'm sure you, you are much quicker at this at finding the bug possibly. Right. And um, that, makes it easier for me to um, to get fast to a, to a fix for this. Okay, however, let's go on with Gaussian processes. And today we talk about Gaussian process classification, which should be somewhere here. So this is Gaussian processes. So that was model selection on GP for re GP regression. Today we talk about Gaussian process classification. Okay, and we want to do it in a Bayesian inference manner. So we want to be kind of fully Bayesian about it. So what was that about? So an early example was the beta binomial model. And now we also have the Gaussian process regression model. And both um, all of these Bayesian inference things, they always have the same plot, right? So we specify prior and the likelihood. So the prior is telling us our knowledge, explaining the knowledge that we have about the unknown parameters of the model. Okay, so what exact parameters do we want? To fit the data, then there's an, a, a function or a distribution the, uh, describing the likelihood, which is telling us, let's assume we have already the perfect parameter theta and it's fixed and we know it, so we can use it. How would the data look like? Okay, so that is the likelihood. And that basically can be specified the prior and the likelihood without seeing any data. And then comes the data in and we make an observation. And then the mathematics basically base rule tells us how to combine the prior distribution and the likelihood distribution to get a posterior distribution, right? And that is now a new updated distribution over the unknown. So the um, distribution without seeing the data was the prior and then given the data, we have a different distribution where typically the distribution is now changed by our observations X in this case. And this is a nice setup, the beta binomial model because the um, the class of distributions where we um, pick the prior from here is the beta distributions with certain parameters alpha and beta. And luckily the posterior has the same shape. So why is that nice? Because suppose um, we see a couple of data points and we have a new belief about the unknown, which we now call posterior. But tomorrow we wake up and we want to continue and have more data. And then the posterior from today will become um, our prior of the next day. And then we can kind of continue and combine additional information to get more and more information into the better distribution. So what does it mean now to have more information in here? So basically, ideally the distribution, the variance would go down around the true parameters, okay? And so in principle, maybe after the first day, maybe you have already approximate estimate, point estimate of the true parameter, which might be the mean of the beta distribution. However, we are still kind of unsure. So the variance is quite large because we have only a couple of data points seen. And then we see more and more data and then ideally the variance shrinks around the true solution. So the same story could be told for Gaussian process regression. Here also we have like the prime and the likelihood, which is specifying everything that we want, that we know before seeing any data or before seeing data until today. So we specify a certain class for the function. So it should be a Gaussian process where we need to specify a mean function and covariance function. And then luckily later on the posterior has the same shape. So also here we have this nice setup that the prior and the posterior are basically from the same class of distributions. 
And then the likelihood is one that is compatible with the prior and the posterior. So such a setup is also called, um, uh, they are called, um, ah, now I forgot the word. So this, these are the conjugate priors. Okay, so in a way for a GP regression, the GP prior is the conjugate prior for this likelihood function, okay? And it's conjugate because then afterwards the posterior left the same shape, okay? I was missing the word conjugate. And the same here, since the input basically is the prior distribution is a better distribution and the output will be a better distribution. Yeah, so for that reason, it's also a conjugacy, a conjugate situation over here. And that's like the nice situation. However, as we will see, it turns out that when we do Gaussian process classification, Unfortunately, we won't end up with something nice over here, but everything gets ugly, okay? But then we do some approximation and everything is feasible again. Um, so this is just a reminder what was Gaussian process regression. So basically this is explaining all the different bits and pieces um, where um, the curious thing here is that we really have an update formula for the mean function and an update formula for the kernel function. And this is written out in its full generality. So not assuming mean zero or something, but just assuming any mean, which I always like to stress because that is like the general case which can be applied to the situation. You see some data today, you update your mean function and your covariance function, then you see some update tomorrow. And tomorrow your mean function, your prime mean function won't be zero, right? Because you take the one from today. So that's why I like these formulas, even though they look a bit more complicated than the stuff that you find in textbooks. Good, so that is the usual one. Let's now try to apply this for classification. And here we are basically following a couple of chapters in Rasmussen and Williams' Gaussian process book, which is like section three. And there, here's a couple of things along which I'm also going. So the stuff that I'm showing you now in the following is basically the things that help me understand the chapter better. So I'm not reproducing everything like identically how it is in the book, but I explain it in my own style, but of course the plot is from the book. So ideally you get the most out of it by reading in the book and the parts that you don't understand, you look at the lectures, the parts that you don't understand, you ask on Rocket Chat and we will help you, okay? So the setup is in classification, we are given some training data with location and now not values, but labels, okay? And there are a couple of approaches how to apply, uh, how, how to do classification here. Let me first draw on the board an example, right? Since our GP so fast were, were some functions like this, right? Where our locations X were one dimensional and our value Y was some real number, okay? And we had some observations maybe and we wanted to learn a function that goes through these observations. Now, how does how do we get a classification problem out of this? So we get a classification problem out of this basically by saying we only have exactly two values, a zero and a one, and that's it, okay? Of course, they are on the real line, but those are two possible values. However, my observations now that I have, I have certain locations down here on the x-axis, and then, for example, I would say, so this location is a minus, that is another minus, and here are three pluses. Then I would draw it like this, so I have a point over here, and then I have points up there, okay? And by this now, I could say, okay, in a way, this is a regression problem, right? I mean, I could draw a line like this, and this line that goes nicely through the data points is telling me at point five, kind of exactly where I want to be, okay? However, possibly the function here, whatever goes on like this and it can go to infinity or something. So depending on our kernel functions, it could be arbitrarily large. Would it be nice kind of to, to get probabilities, right? And so what we need to do is we need to take the output of a Gaussian process and kind of we squeeze it into the interval from zero to one, yeah, with the sigmoid function. And that's what I want to show you. But before we do that, let me show you um, different ways now of approaching a classification problem, okay? And we go back to the plot along the way. So there's a generative approach and let me flash it for you, the discriminative approach. Let me first talk about the generative approach, okay? So the generative approach is somehow modeling uh, the P of X comma Y. 
Okay, so the joint distribution gets modeled in the generative approach and it tells us how the data was generated, for example. So how do we generate such classification problems? Basically, we can uh, have it uh, basically like a probability for the labels, right? So this is just a Bernoulli distribution. It's just a flip of a coin, either zero or one. So it's a very simple one. So in principle, it's just one number, right? So you just need to store the number of success, for example. And then depending on the, the choice of the coin, yeah, I'm either sampling an X from one Gaussian distribution or I sample it from another Gaussian distribution with another mean. So um, in this case now, so how could we do this? So we could basically count now the number of zeros and the number of ones in the training data. And that gives us a nice estimate for the P of Y being equal to one. Okay, so far so simple. And then we make two groups. So the groups for the first class and the group for the zero class. And for each of them, we estimate the mean and the covariance matrices, okay? And now this gives us then a simple classifier because this will specify everything here in the joint distribution. And then we can also flip it around and we can condition on the X and can use P of Y given X. Since if we have the joint, we can also have either conditional or the other one, yeah? Just by dividing through the uh, probability distribution of the, the remaining one. So that would give us a simple classifier. So in the picture on the board, um, it would look like this. So those are my examples for one class. Okay, great. So let's learn, um, let's find the mean and the variance for that class. So that would be mu zero. And then here I will have sigma zero. And here's the other one. So I get here the, the mu one plus some sigma one and the two parameters, right? Just from the data like this. So that would be the generative approach, okay? And as you know, the curious thing is also there's a causal, anti-causal learning type of discussion here, right? So here we are kind of modeling um, supposedly the causal direction. So you first have the class and then you generate your sample. That's often the case, for example, for digit recognition. Not always, right? As we've seen, there are also examples where this is different. But um, typically, like, that's often the setup in classification that we are kind of doing the reading task where we are learning the anti-causal direction. However, here we are modeling in the generative approach, we are modeling the causal direction typically. Okay, unfortunately, um, if you run it on benchmarks, often this is not good enough, right? Because maybe the data is not really looking like a Gaussian distribution. There might be examples over here on the other side. Uh, oh, you can still see it. So there might be examples down here as well, okay? And then measuring a Gaussian, fitting a Gaussian distribution to these and these examples, like would give me a very wide one. And then it's very hard to distinguish and to decide from which is which, right? So it, it could be a, a very simplistic approach. Of course, you can then start and say, okay, I can have more complicated density thing, density estimation over here. I can learn a mixture of Gaussian and so on and so forth. And this all is totally valid and you can try it. And sometimes even it's the best thing you can do. However, it turns out like 20 years ago when classification like was a super big topic in machine learning, it turned out that the discriminative approach, so the other one is more successful. And the basic reason for this is that in the discriminative approach, we don't bother with modeling the full joint distribution, but instead we mainly model just the distribution that we are interested in. So we directly model P of Y given X instead of modeling P of X comma Y, which includes that one. We are only modeling basically our decision function, which is like the probability that we have a certain class given that we've seen a certain pattern, okay? And in this case, it means we are not, whoops, we are not really modeling P of X, okay? Instead, we ignore it. We ignore that distribution. And that turned out to be much more successful and like a support vector machine and all the other classifiers, they basically are discriminative approaches and they are super successful for the classification problem. Um, why? Because kind of we only focus on the stuff like that is relevant to our problem and relevant to our problem here is only P of Y given X and we don't care for P of X. And as you might know, density estimation is a super complicated problem and kind of we are 
we are overdoing it over here. So possibly we are solving a really hard problem in the generative approach, right? While it would be sufficient just to learn a discrimination function, which works well on our data. Having said that, that is the narrative that you typically hear between generative and discriminative model. Having given you a lecture on causality, yeah, you should reconsider that thought. However, when you look into the books and you have a chapter on classification, typically you have these two, two poles, the generative approach, which is more like density estimation based, which doesn't work so well. And then there's the discriminative approach, which is like more going to the essential stuff and then excelling at the benchmarks. However, when you talk about causal learning and anti-causal learning, you might want to reconsider also the generative approach. Okay, nonetheless, we are now also trying to model this P of Y given X directly. So we are not bothering for the joint, but we want to learn this one directly. And we want to use regression output, which could be an arbitrary number from minus infinity to plus infinity and turn it into class probabilities. So those are just the side notes that I told you. So um, the choice between generative and discriminative might be between causal and anti-causal learning or between anti-causal and causal learning. So that's always something to keep in mind. Yeah? And you are well ahead of the typical textbook stuff if you are aware of this, if you work for a company or do a scientific project and you have this causal loop in your brain as well, that could be really some essential additional trick that you can put on the table to solve problems. And um, as you know, Choosing one or the other enables or disables covariate shift robustness. So when the input distribution changes or it's disabling, enabling semi-supervised learning. So it's good to have that in mind. However, for now, let's ignore it. And just at the blackboard, I think it is on the blackboard. We have a one dimensional locations X um, and then we have classes one and zero. And we want to find like a decision function with Gaussian process uh, regression. Um, however, of course, this is like super simplified, right? In principle, we are doing, let's say, handwritten digit recognition. Then we don't have a one dimensional space here, but instead our space is like 784 dimensional, right? So it's really high dimensional. But as you know, this is just our cartoon model, like to have a GP regression on the board. In principle, there's no restrict restriction on implementing everything with kernel functions which is calculating similarity in the 784 dimensional space of MNIST, okay? So in principle, all the GP regression stuff can be applied to very high dimensional location and there's no problem with that, yeah? You're just calculating the kernel matrices different, differently and the rest of the code that we have is the same. Essential is only that the output is one dimensional, okay? Of course, if you run it for each of the output coordinate, you could have separate independent GPs for each of them and you can also correlate them and get fancy. Also, all of that exists. However, for us, we draw it like this because it's convenient on the board and on the slides and for visualization. However, we are not limited to a one dimensional X, okay? In particular, this data set looks really a bit awkward, right? A 1D classification problem it's just saying, okay, I have a threshold or I have two thresholds. That's it, right? So I don't need neural networks. I do need any sophisticated one. But keep in mind, this is only a cartoon. So in principle, if your input space, uh, your location space would be two dimensional, you would learn a complicated surface, a complicated decision surface, which is going up and down and up and down. And if your space is 784 dimensional, of course, the whole thing is even higher dimensional. Okay, like in 3D, it's like a temperature gradient with changing temperature suddenly or something. Yeah, so there's no limit to that. But we stick to this visualization here. Okay, so um, the decision function is a mapping from X to Y, fine, right? Um, so the first idea that we just discussed it, we just do regression on the um, classification probability. So suppose we want to learn a function X is mapped onto P of Y being in the first class given X, okay? And we model this function using linear regression. Then the obvious problem that we run into is linear regression or Gaussian process regression is giving us arbitrary linear numbers, uh, arbitrary real numbers, but we need probabilities. So the second idea that we need, we need to turn these numbers into probabilities using a link function, okay? And the link functions are just the ones that we've seen already quite often. So there's the logistic regression 
uh, so there's the uh, logistic function also called sigmoidal function which is mapping the interval minus infinity to plus infinity to the interval zero to one exactly like we want to have it and if we use this link function here the whole regression stuff is called logistic regression which you might have read okay sometimes people call it also linear logistic regression or logistic linear regression uh, so there are different variants of this one however there are other links functions so this is basically the um, cumulative distribution function of the Gaussian okay so it's also a function which starts at minus infinity with zero and then it goes up to one for plus infinity and it has a very related shape to the logistic one so they look very very similar um, and if we use this link function then the whole thing is called probit regression okay since that's how we turn the arbitrary numbers into the interval zero to one. So the key here is that we turn real numbers into probabilities. Okay, so that's the idea. However, again, thinking back to the um, chapter on causality, did I mention that if everything is Gaussian, causal inference is not possible, right? So there, you couldn't do something interesting with Gaussians because you can turn around a Gaussian arbitrarily, it stays Gaussian, right? Which is good for GP regression, however, as soon as you apply something non-linear to your Gaussian distribution, the whole thing is not Gaussian anymore. And that's exactly what's happening here. So those are two possible non-linear functions, and we want to apply them to the output of a GP regression, which is nicely Gaussian distributed. So we are transforming a Gaussian distribution with a non-linear function. And that means we are getting out of the class of Gaussian distribution. So we are getting something more complicated. Okay, so the functions, they look like this for if you apply them. So here's your input x on this axis. This is like from minus infinity to plus infinity, some output of a GP, for example. And then we squeeze it through our, um, uh, in this case, a sigmoid function. So this is just the, um, the logistic logic fun logit function. And we squeeze it between 0 and 1. And this one can be used as a decision function for our um, classifier. Or we can even say, with this one we are really modeling the probabilities of being in one or in the other class okay so again written out what we are doing is we assume for example um, a gaussian prior on the weights yeah just like in linear regression so this is linear regression and then the output of our linear regression is just the inner product with our location but to that location that's still gaussian distributed but then we apply a nonlinear function to squeeze it between zero and one and that will be interest, uh, interpreted as a probability of being in a certain class. And similarly, we can plug in other ones. Um, note that for symmetric link functions, so functions where we have the property that everything on the negative axis is one minus everything on the positive axis, which holds, for example, for those two. Now we can also write this expressions more succinctly in general for p of y which could be plus one or minus one and plug the plus one or minus one in here okay so that's something just a little trick for notation great so let's now what do we have so we have here now a prior which is now a prior on the weights so we are still talking about linear regression not yet about gp regression okay and we just pass the output through a link function now, the posterior can be derived, yeah, and it is done in, in the Rasmussen-Williamson book on page 37. Uh, it turns out to be something looking a little bit like a Gaussian, okay? So we, here we have written out the logarithm of the posterior distribution of the W. Um, so the first term looks like e to the minus something from a Gaussian distribution. However, the second term now is the logarithm of the sigma. And that doesn't have any nice form or anything nice, okay? So if the sigma wouldn't be here, yeah, then, or if, if, if we, we would get out some linear term in W or something, then kind of we could combine it with this one over here and we could get a Gaussian distribution out of it. But since here's this nonlinearity, this thing does not look anymore any Gaussian, okay? Similarly, if we derive the posterior predictive distribution, yeah, which is, integrating out the w yeah, from our uh, setup here. So given the posterior distribution for our w and given the likelihood, so this gives us a distribution of a new data point. Yeah, If you write it down, then first of all, this guy over here is non-Gaussian and this is a nonlinear function. So the whole integration is more complicated and we cannot expect to see something simple.
in the book they have a nice plot so the first two plots are from regression and the second two plots are from classification okay so even though um, the w initially might have a gaussian distribution so that is the prior of the w so this is w1 w2 and there might be many more but let's only look at two parameters for which we have a prior okay then in this case so they assume a standard normal distributed prior so that's a nice circle so it could be also ellipse or something but it's a gaussian distribution and now if we suppose we have in a two-dimensional location space with x1 and x2 we had like these three data points from one class and three other data points from the other class then we can take the formula from the previous slide which tells us the posterior distribution of the w and we can also plot the isolines and unfortunately now this is not gaussian anymore but you see it's still unimodal okay so there's only one maximum and it still looks kind of circular and something so it looks like a circular shape but not exactly okay so there are some differences so why do we care kind of for exactness yeah i mean it would be nice to really get the right variances however if you see this then the intuition the solution to all this big mess is now to approximate this posterior distribution again with the gaussian distribution okay which says basically find the mean of this complicated one and find the covariance matrix of this complicated distribution and then we can say and now the corresponding gaussian distribution which is approximately looking very similar but having like really like iso circuits with similar distances so an approximated posterior distribution can then be used for inference and that's basically how it's done however the last plot here is just showing you again with the x1 and x2 and it's visualizing the decision boundary that we would get for the posterior predictive distribution okay so the posterior predictive distribution down here it is basically um, integrating out over the true posterior distribution and then telling us what is the probability of being in one class or the other and as you see here so where here the circles are so that is where you are in class one so you have a high probability of being in class one and down here where the crosses are we have a low one and here you see a nice decision boundary okay so the output by the way is quite nice it's not only telling you the decision boundary and the margin but it's also giving you probabilities however as always when you see something bayesian and you see such a nice thing as a practitioner you would say yeah that's exactly what i want to have i don't care anymore for support vector machines they only say yes and no i of course want to know the probabilities you always have to be there's always a caveat that you put in strong assumptions like that one right so you have a certain prior and you have you have a certain likelihood of observing data and you might have done a certain approximation to the posterior to obtain such a plot yeah so always you have to pay something for these additional nice outputs here with additional assumptions but nonetheless i think it's super useful good so the advantages of doing this is that we get probabilities unlike other classical methods however as i said there are assumptions disadvantages is the mass is not gaussian anymore so it's we have to struggle a bit more with the mass with the mathematics here right so everything gets a bit more difficult and you have to learn about laplace approximation to really solve it okay um so what i show you next is first of all i want to show you now exactly what terms in the in the typical derivation that we do with gp regression turn into non-gaussians when we do gp classification and then i tell you how to deal with it so we do a laplace approximation okay so that's it which is a general tool that can be applied to a lot of context not only gp classification but it's a general tool to approximate an arbitrary distribution with a gaussian distribution that's basically it that's a laplace distribution uh, laplace approximation however of course it's ideally applicable if you have like a unimodal distribution right with, with only one bump if you have several bumps then the laplace approximation could be very wrong right so the the mean of a multimodal distribution could be in an area where there's basically no probability of of seeing data or something right so one needs to be careful a, li a little bit however let's first kind of look at the pieces of gp regression again and let's again try to understand how it was and for this yet another view of gp regression so this is for a single data point 
So suppose or as a data set of data points, so that doesn't matter very much. Or let's say this is a set of locations and we have a, a GP, uh, a, a sample from a GP. So P of F is, a, is basically a GP distributed with a certain mean function and covariance function. And the locations, they are not given any distribution. So they are just given. I don't specify them. That means they have the fate of always standing on the right hand side of the bar. They can never be on the left hand side of the bar because I'm not specifying a distribution for them. However, that's the whole idea of a discriminative approach. We don't care where the locations are. Um, then basically we can draw now the function value f of x yeah, that we can calculate once we decide a particular function f and a particular location. So which is just this f of x. And we say basically there's also a distribution, basically it's a delta peak distribution, right? That the function value for location x is a particular value. So this f sub x here is really a vector. Maybe I should put it down here as well. So that the f sub x is really a vector of numbers and n-dimensional vectors where I have a value for each of the locations. Um, however, it's deterministically um, fixed by having the um, function value f and my location. So that's why basically it's a delta function, which is like an, a little bit weird distribution. So it's one which is like infinitely high at the zero. So, and that's more like heavy math. I prefer to write it just using the Iverson brackets, okay? And then when integrations come up, I wave my hand and at the end, everything is Gaussian, okay? So, but there might be distribution theory, there might be better mathematics that really properly deal with these kind of integrations later on. Anyway, and then there's the, um, in this case, that's the likelihood. So given that I know the, the actual value f of x or f sub x, so how do I measure, how do I do my measurements? And that's also a Gaussian distribution. And that is not by chance a Gaussian distribution, but typically here, everything needs to be Gaussian kind of, so that the outcome at the end is a Gaussian process again, okay? Um, so if we now would write our, uh, integrate out our function f, right? So basically we extend the p of f sub x given x and we want to omit the function f. Yeah, so that's, so let's put it in here. And then we are doing this integration where this equation sign, a little miracle appears where we basically use the property of a GP. So a GP evaluated at a certain location is Gaussian distributed. So that's how we get this equation sign at the end here. Okay, so that's how we resolve this integration. However, the integration itself is not properly defined here because it's an integration of a function. So this is more like a cartoon of the derivation. However, at the end, being sampled from a GP, yeah, we know that the, or being distributed according to a GP, the F, we know that the output is Gaussian distributed. That's just the definition of it with a particular mean vector and a particular covariance matrix. Um, okay, so far so good. So this is like um, a summary where we now included different terms. So where I have an assumption about the F. I don't have an assumption about the X. So it can only appear on the right-hand side of the, so it can only be conditioned on the right-hand side of the bar. And then I have a distribution for the F sub X and I have the distribution and the distribution for the observations. Now, if I have new observations, right? So if I have test data, now my graph changes like that. So that is basically generating all my training data. The same F is generating my test data. And now by observing pairs X and Y, I learn something about the F and this influences my knowledge about new observations. So new locations X star and then their corresponding observations. And as you know, they are all jointly Gaussian. Okay. So the, um, f sub x and the f sub x stars, if you put those into a big vector, right, then they will be jointly Gaussian distributed according to a GP, okay? It's like including the x star into the x and then using the same formula. And similarly for the measurements, I have something similar. Um, now let's look at the type of distributions that we have. So if you write everything out, it turns out that the predictive distribution at the end is a Gaussian distribution because we are only integrating here over Gaussian. So that is really a Gaussian distribution. And that is now a Gaussian distribution. That's why I wanted to remove on the previous slide the F and replace it with an F sub index. 
because this is now really, it's a real number or it's a vector of values. And that is actually Gaussian distributed and the integration is really defined. And then if you do a Gaussian with a Gaussian and integrate over it, you get a Gaussian distribution out of this. However, of course, not always, but in your Gaussian, if in the first Gaussian distribution, the variable you are integrating with is on the right-hand side of the bar and on the other one, it's on the left-hand side of the bar. It's like saying, I'm integrating out this distribution where I'm kind of using this Gaussian distribution to condition on another Gaussian distribution. If that's the case, then the overall Y star will be Gaussian distributed, okay? That just follows from the nice roots of the Gaussian distribution. Good. Um, so here again, everything is Gaussian. So let's figure out. So the um, given some locations, my values are Gaussian. Given the values, my measurements are Gaussian. So the joint is overall Gaussian. And then also, also all marginals and all conditional distributions are, are Gaussian. So everything is fine and perfect. Um, let's move on to Gaussian process classification. And the reason why I made this picture up here is that we are now replacing the connection from the F sub X to the Y. So I'm, connect, I'm changing the link from here to here. And I say already link because now the transformation from the F sub X to the Y is not just a measurement where I add some additional Gaussian noise on it, but it's an application of my link function. So this is now a nonlinear transformation going from here to here. Okay, so that's the thing that changes for Gaussian process classification. Now, the question on the next slide that I try to elaborate a little bit on is now why is the predictive distribution not Gaussian anymore? Okay, so the predictive distribution is the one of the Y star given my data and given a new location. The very short answer is it's already non-Gaussian because my measurement process or my transformation or my link from the F sub X star to the Y star is non-Gaussian, is non-linear, right? So that is a non-linear transformation. So even if though this guy would be a Gaussian distributed, the Y star wouldn't be Gaussian distributed. However, it's even worse, already the F sub X star is also not Gaussian distributed. So let's look at the details here. So I want to show that the predictive distribution is not Gaussian for several reasons. So of course, the likelihood is non-Gaussian, but let's look also at the other terms. So the other term is Z1 over here, and maybe I should change the order of presentation. So the first term is non-Gaussian, fine, but the second is also non-Gaussian. So let me rewrite the second term as an integral, right, which I did over here, where I'm integrating out the F sub X. So the right-hand side here, Z1 is Gaussian distributed. Um, However, uh, whoops, so is this wrong now? So it looks like um, this might be equal to a Gaussian distribution. I have to think about it. However, that is then, no, 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 it's not, it's not true. Let me think about it for a second. Ah, okay. Okay, so the first term is Gaussian distributed. So far, so good. Okay, but what about the second term? So the second term here is written out in the line above. So that's, I'm confused by the ordering, how I'm presenting this stuff here. So let's write base rule for that term and let's look at the single pieces here. Again, P of F sub X given X is, no, is Gaussian, but again, this one is using the link function and that one is non-Gaussian. Okay, so this term, the functional values given the locations in the training data, so that's Gaussian distributed. However, turning those into probabilities is no longer Gaussian distributed. So this is unfortunately broken since the, the product now of two Gaussians will be Gaussians, but with something else, it's not Gaussian. Then the whole thing is not Gaussian distributed anymore. So the problem here is not that the F sub X and the X are not uh, connected with the Gaussian, but additionally, we are considering on the, on the values and the values in order to influence the F sub X goes through the inverse link function, which is non-Gaussian. And so the whole distribution is non-Gaussian, okay? That's bad luck because it means that the P of F sub X over here is also non-Gaussian. And even though we multiply with the Gaussian distribution, the resulting integration will not resolve to a Gaussian distribution. Of course, my reasoning here is a bit shaky, right? Uh, 
We could be lucky. Yeah, you take a super ugly distribution here. You take a super ugly distribution on the other side, and surprisingly, the integration will be a Gaussian distribution. Right? That in principle could happen, but I think in practice it doesn't. So maybe there's a book on. I think there's a book on counterexamples in probability. If we would find two distributions which are non-Gaussian, which should then integrate against each other until you got a Gaussian. Um, probably we should include it into the book of counterexamples. Actually, I should should check the book back whether there is a counterexample, but it's very unlikely that this will happen. Okay. Okay. So unfortunately, the first term is non-Gaussian. The second term is non-Gaussian. The whole thing is non-Gaussian. Okay. So that's bad luck. How can we do now inference? Right. Bayesian inference to a large part that we've seen so far, apart from beta binomial models was inference with Gaussian distributions, right? Everything was Gaussian and everything was nice. Now, how can we do inference? I said that already. So now what we're doing is we are using a Laplace approximation, which sounds super fancy, but basically what it is, it just says, okay, let's pick one of the distributions here, which are super relevant for our inference, and let's replace it with the Gaussian distribution, okay? So let's take that one, for example, which is not a Gaussian distribution, and let's approximate it by a different distribution, where now different here is denoted by a different letter Q. Okay, so the Q, by definition, is a Gaussian distribution of the input variable F sub X with a certain mean and a certain covariance matrix. Okay, where now the certain mean gets the name F sub X hat, just a name, and the um, appropriate covariance matrix just gets this very suggestive name sigma F sub X, okay? And um, I could have put in here the mean, for example, but putting in here the true mean of this distribution is not giving us a Laplace approximation. So the Laplace approximation is taking the true covariance matrix here, probably, yeah, but it's not taking here the, the right mean, it's taking something else. I tell you what it takes, it takes the maximum of this distribution, which is for something which is like non-symmetric, typically not the mean. So what does it buy us? It, it, will, it will buy us that now this expression over here can be replaced with the Q function. And so we will have an integration of a Gaussian with a Gaussian, okay? And the whole thing will be Gaussian, great. So we can plug the Gaussian in here. Now, does it solve our initial problem? Not completely because that one over there is still something nonlinear, something weird, however, this one for the posterior predictive distribution is just a one dimensional integration. So in principle, we are fine with dealing with this ugly integral because it's just one dimensional and we can calculate it using sampling. That's something we learn next, next week, I think, um, or with some other tricks. So, however, if we don't know how to sample like examples here, right, then it's very hard to calculate. Suppose this is a Gaussian distribution. It's very simple to generate samples from it and we can approximate this integration very well. There are lots of other alternatives because this is an approximation and it's an expensive way to do it partially. And at the point where Gaussian process classification was invented and was competing against other classification methods, it was competing against something like support vector machines, decision trees and all of these things. So all the people who like Bayesian inference a lot of course, they tried many different things to get a good approximation. Um, and another one is called expectation propagation, also called EP, which would be another lecture just to explain what it is. It's yet another way to deal with ugly distributions in terms of nice looking Gaussian distributions. But we won't go into the detail. However, there's a whole section on it in Rasmussen and Williams, if you are curious into these Bayesian approaches, but it's not part of the lecture. Okay. I said it in word on the previous slide. So we approximate the one particular non-Gaussian distribution with the Gaussian one, and we replace, so the P with our Q distribution inside the integration, yeah, to get really a Gaussian, a Gaussian solution for the integration. And then we plug it into the average posterior predictive distribution where we now have a one dimensional difficult integration, right? So even for the, if you put the sigma probit in here, there are even tables of functions 
how you can already uh, also solve this thing in a closed form solution, or you can solve this integral by sampling. Okay. So now why is it nice? Because um, kind of it, it will not only give us at the end, like a point estimate of the class, but when we can calculate this integration and sample from it, we could also um, get like confidence intervals for our solution, right? So we are partially Bayesian. So we are, in a way we are fully Bayesian, but in between kind of, we need to use some clever approximations here. Okay, good. Um, now Laplace approximation, let me explain you what it is. And I try to explain to you in a more general point of view, not like applied to GP classification, but let's look at it a little bit more general. So don't be scared by being more general. Actually, it's more simple, right? So instead of approximating now our P of F sub something and so on, we are approximating P of Z. And P of Z can be any distribution of some variable Z. And it's a non-Gaussian distribution and we want to approximate it with a Gaussian distribution, okay? So we need to find some appropriate mean for our variable Z and appropriate covariance matrix. So the idea is that we approximate the log PDF, right, with a second order polynomial. As you know, probability distributions are quite often, uh, they are always numbers between zero and infinity, the densities, right? So they typically can be written as e to the something, right? Since the e function is mapping the minus infinity and plus infinity to zero to plus infinity. So in principle, taking the logarithm of a density is a good thing to do because it gives us now the range from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? Since the logarithm is the inverse of the e function of the exponential function, it's kind of remapping the values, the values from zero to plus infinity back to the whole real line, okay? And now, um, of course, where the P of Z is zero, right? So where the density, there's nothing or almost nothing. So let's say it's epsilon. So it's very, very small numbers. Then the logarithm of these very, very small numbers will be minus infinity, okay? So that's very much going down. For example, if we look at the logarithm of a Gaussian distribution, yeah, what we get is a parabola. So let's say this is x. Okay, this is another plot with x. And let's say this is p of x. And this is logarithm of p of x. Okay, then basically, this is a familiar shape that you have, right? And that's something e to the minus blah, blah, blah squared. Okay, when you look at the logarithm of this density, what you get is you get an exact parabola, okay? And it's really a parabola because this one is x of minus x squared. So if I take the logarithm of this guy, I get a function minus x squared. So this thing is really minus x squared. Okay, now let's take another distribution. Let's say one which is, um, okay, let me, let me make something like this. Uh, no, that's not a good one. Okay, so it's going up like that and then it suddenly goes down, okay? So maybe this distribution over here. So how would it look over there? So it's going earlier to very small, so it's it's probably going up something like that, and then it has a really slower movement to go down. So it might be not a parabola like this, but instead it might be something, I mean, it's also a little bit lower, so it could be something like this, which is going also down to minus infinity, but it's not looking nice and symmetric like a parabola, but it's a little bit like distorted type of thing. And that could be the logarithm of another distribution, which is non-Gaussian, okay? Now the idea of the Laplace approximation is to approximate such a um, weird looking distribution with a Gaussian distribution, okay? So basically what we're trying to do is, we're trying to fit a parabola inside the shape of that one, okay? And that corresponds to 
moving around our Gaussian distribution down here and trying to fit in here a Gaussian distribution which kind of nicely captures the most important structure of the complicated distribution. Curious, you might have seen something when you calculate derivatives or something that you kind of at a location here, you are approximating it with a straight line, right? And you know, in a small interval in here, you are doing a very good job, okay? Now, talking about it more theoretically, it's like having a Laplace, of, uh, it's like having a Taylor expansion of this function, right? And only taking the linear term. So you're only trying to fit a linear function at one location to the complicated one. Now, having a squared function is basically the same story. It's also trying to use a Taylor expansion of the more complicated function, but only using like the, the constant term, the linear term and the square term, okay? By the way, that's exactly the story of doing a Newton method in optimization, right? In gradient descent, you are only using the slope and using that to find the next one. In the Newton method, you're also taking the second derivative, which corresponds to the second term in the Taylor expansion, and you're approximating in your optimization problem the problem with the squared function, and then you jump right into the, the optimum. So in a way, the Laplace approximation yeah, that we are using here for probabilities is like very much in parallel to a Newton method in optimization, okay? So, what did I say? I said that we are approximating the log PDF with the second order polynomial, which is a sophisticated way of saying we are approximating it with some um, parabola, okay? So, I just write it like that because we are like, high dimensional, but in principle what's written here is we are trying to approximate it with an expression that looks like this. So let me write it for 1D, so minus 0.5 and then we have Z minus some, some mean squared, okay, times some variance, okay, variance squared. So something like this, right, so it's, and if you, if you Write it out, you have 0 0.5 and then you have z squared minus 2 mu blah 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 blah. So you really have just a polynomial with degree 2. And the thing that we've seen here on the slide is just a vector version of a parabola. Okay, and it's typically written with multiplying a vector, a row vector from the left to a matrix and a column vector from the right. And the outcome will be a single real number. Okay, however, this is also exactly the expression that you have in the Gaussian distribution. So the reason why we write it in this shape is because then the mu and the sigma, they play the roles of the parameters of a Gaussian distribution. Um, so for the story with the Taylor expansion, we can of course also write out the second order Taylor expansion of our log PDF. So let's look at this one. So typically for the Taylor expansion, you need to choose a single point z hat, right, in this case. So a fixed point, and then you say the Taylor expansion of my function p of z, log p of z, is the function value at this location z hat, plus the difference of my interesting z point minus my function, uh, my location that I've chosen to take the expansion, times the derivative at z1, and that would be like the linear interpolation of my function. However, I can add also the second term, where I'm now in here, I'm, I'm having basically the Hessian matrix, which is basically the second derivative of my function, okay? And it's written here with two gradient symbols, okay? So that is the Hessian distribution. So that is the multivariate second order Taylor expansion, okay? And again, the nice thing here is it directly corresponds to a Gaussian distribution. Actually, when I learned in infinitesimal rechnung one or analysis one, when I learned about Taylor expansion, I would have never expected to see it again in the context of Gaussian distributions. But it is really the same thing, okay? So it's really the first two terms are exactly the Gaussian distribution approximation. Good, so far so good. Uh, we are completely free to choose the z hat in a Taylor expansion, right? It works for all of the points. It's just a question how fast the other terms are going to zero. And the, the choice for the Laplace approximation here is, 
Yeah, so intuitively we want to have the, the bump right at the, at the uh, largest point of my complicated function. I could have put also taken that point and then put a Gaussian over here, right? But that might not be a very good approximation, okay? So that might not be a good idea. So it's better to put it here at the maximum. So typically we choose now the z hat to be the arc max of the logarithm of p of z. Okay, so far so good. So as I said, the second order Taylor expansion is really a Gaussian approximation. Um, so we choose the maximum um, of this function to be the location where we do the expansion. And then curiously, since we are at the maximum, we have a nice side effect. The side effect is that the gradient at this maximum is equal to zero. Okay, so this linear term just disappears, which makes it look even stronger like a Gaussian distribution now. So now you really just can do e to the minus this stuff over there and you have a Gaussian distribution since this term over there is just a constant. Okay, so it's really by choosing this f had to be the maximum, you get directly Gaussian distribution. Um, and now the question is, how do we find these parameters, right? So let's flip back. We have given a complicated distribution from our GP classification. We want to approximate it with the Gaussian distribution and we use the strategy of a Laplace approximation, which tells us um, expand it at the mode, at the maximum of the complicated distribution and then calculate the corresponding Hessian matrix and calculate, and that's it, right? So we only need the Hessian matrix. So let's look at that further. So um, this covariance matrix is basically the inverse of the Hessian. So now how, do, how can we calculate it? So just do it, right? So let's write it out. So our Psi function now is the logarithm of our complicated distribution. So we flip back to the GP classification problem. And if we write it out, yeah, so basically using Bayes rule or one of the formulas, um, the logarithm applied to Bayes rule turns Bayes rule into a summation minus the third term minus the evidence where the evidence is constant with respect to F sub X. So the evidence is basically the term back here. That's the log evidence but we have the two other terms and they are just summed up. Now the first term, what is it? So that is basically this Iverson bracket. So it's taking the link function, okay? So let's keep it like it is. So let's don't worry about it too much. But the other term is a Gaussian um, distribution, right? So that was the property of a GP that if we have locations and the function values and the F are the function values, they are not the class probabilities. Those got the name Y. So these function values, they are Gaussian distributed and the logarithm of this guy is getting rid of the E function and what remains is basically an expression like that for this Gaussian distribution in here. And then it turns out that um, it, it can be rewritten um, using the kernel matrix. So the inverse kernel matrix is the correct covariance matrix of this Gaussian distribution. Okay, great. So this is having now a nice expression for the Psi function. Let's calculate the first derivative. Again, we don't worry about the first term over here. We are only interested in the second one. I mean, we are interested in the first one, but that depends on the link function. So calculating the derivative of this um, quadratic form is just giving us a matrix vector multiplication. And then if we calculate yet another gradient, we just end up with the inverse covariance function and some first term. So one can note um, that the W in front, so this guy is called minus W, and one can show that that's just a diagonal matrix because the different functional values only depend on, or the different probabilities Y only depend on the functional value that the corresponding, where the corresponding link is. That's why basically like of the first test data point, it doesn't matter for the value of the second test data point. So it just doesn't care. So for that reason, the, this W is a diagonal matrix and the entries um, can be calculated depending on the choice of my function, okay? And in the book, there's a table for different link functions. What exactly will be the W? And then you can look it up in the table, okay? It's like looking into a formula, collection of formulas. Um, 
Curiously, the Hessian overall is um, negative definite, which is good, right? So we want to have negative definiteness because we want to have like a concave function that is going coming from below, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be um, a Gaussian distribution, right? The Hessian being negative definite means that the covariance matrix at the end will be um, positive definite, okay? There, just the whole thing will flip. Good, so far so good. How do we get now this mode of our um, function Psi? We get that one just by some optimization. In the book, they are suggesting Newton's method, okay? Curiously, why do they use Newton's method? Yeah, I mean, we just analyzed this whole guy and found out that there's some quadratic term in here and everything can be nicely calculated and we can explicitly calculate even a closed form solution for the second order derivative, okay, so for the Hessian. So then why not use he Newton's method? That's the most efficient one if you can afford to get the Hessian. Okay, so far so good. Um, there are many more gory details, right? So to really implement this. So they, uh, it's quite tricky, right? And I'm not going further into the details here. What I want to show you just at the end of this Laplace approximation stuff is um, we approximate one of the pieces which is non-Gaussian with the Gaussian distribution where we now have an algorithm um, to get the parameters of this Gaussian distribution. So that one is obtained by a little Newton optimization and that one is obtained by looking it up in a table what's the right for the link function, what is the right formula to calculate the Hessian and then to add that to my inverse covariance matrix and again take the inverse then I'm getting the covariance matrix of this Gaussian distribution. So once I have the parameters, I can plug it into the integration now to get um, a Gaussian distribution for my predictive distribution for the functional value for a test point, okay? And that then at the end will be a Gaussian distribution where I'm now also combining basically the location that I'm having with the stuff that has been used in the approximation of that one. So the the, the, this Gaussian approximation, the Laplace approximation over here was only looking at the training data. It didn't care for the test point. And now in order to get a predictive distribution, basically I'm combining now the covariance information from this Laplace approximation with the similarity information of my test point with the training data, which is contained in the kernel evaluated at training data comma my test point, yeah, and its initial invari uh, variance that it has as well, okay? So that's why these terms appear in here. Good, and then if I really want to have the averaged predictive probability for a test point, I need to solve this one-dimensional integral, which can be done by doing some um, numerical approximations as well. Great, so far so good. Um, the summary of all of this is, Again, GP regression is easy, okay? So if you want to be Bayesian about things, then Gauss, Karl Friedrich Gauss, and his distribution is your friend. He always helps. And as, as long as you stay close to Gauss and Gaussian distributions, everything is fine. Or to be more specific, when you stay close to Gaussian distribution, everything is linear algebra, okay? So there's nothing complicated going on. Taking an inverse here, taking a matrix vector multiplication there. So that's basically how you do Bayesian inference with Gaussian distributions. However, when you leave this comfort zone and you now combine, so my mouse pointer is gone, there it is. If you now combine the Gaussian nice world with a problem like classification where you go over to a discrete world where you kind of have a nonlinearity in between, then unfortunately certain terms are not Gaussian anymore and you have to struggle a bit. And the solution for this is to pick the right one out of here, which is the first one, it's the right one. So that is basically the, the summary of the data. So given a certain model choice, given a certain GP prior, so what is basically the distribution for the locations? And it will be Gaussian um, once you find the right approximation to this complicated one, okay? And once you have this Laplace approximation, then uh, you get a Gaussian distribution along the way that then you can use with some one-dimensional integration to do like a fully Bayesian classification problem.
Okay, so what should you take out of this lecture? Um, basically, those two statements, GP regression is easy, yeah? And it's not really difficult, everything is nice. And G class, GP classification is not so easy. And there you really need some, um, some big cannons to shoot at your data and some really sophisticated stuff. Um, there are many more details to explain all of this, right? I only gave you a sketch about it and it's all nicely written up in the book. However, of course, I, for, for the final exam or anything like this, I don't require you to know all the details from the book, of course, but only the stuff that we did in the lecture. However, there might be a nice exercise question where you also a little bit elaborate a little bit about it and push it a little bit further, okay? The other thing of today is I wanted to give you an example of a Laplace approximation, right? Since we are happy with the Gaussians, the Laplace approximation is a super powerful tool because it allows us to transfer complicated densities into our nice comfort zone where we know how to do Bayesian inference. And so it's a generally applicable method that is also useful for many other situations. Good. Then that's the end of Gaussian processes. And next time we start with a completely new topic. And so we can now close the, uh, the topic for today. And I think today's lecture is a bit shorter. That's good. So at this point, I would like to say thank you for attention. Thanks for switching on the video that helped a lot. And um, I see you on next Monday.